Hey guys, it's me, Father Michael, and I'm doing the first of our Sunday reflections for the Sunday readings coming up for uh, Lent. And so thank you so much for joining us, and hopefully this is a blessing to you, helps you to prepare for these incredible readings. Uh, Lent is is an amazing uh, journey uh, through salvation and history, uh, but also helps us to journey within, to go with the Lord into those places in our hearts uh, where we need to go to uh, receive uh, healing and grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so our readings for the first Sunday of Lent, um, the first reading is from Genesis chapter 2, uh, verses 7 through 9, and Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And what we see here is the, f- the second creation account, um, when the Lord God forms man um, out of the clay of the ground. It's a really intimate uh, creation account um, uh, where he he gets down. It's like God getting down in the mud and forming him. It's it's like almost like a, a you know a kid making uh, making playing with play doh or something like that. And it's such a beautiful scene in this intimacy of God breathing the the this life into into the man. And, uh, and then God placing um, him with care and tenderness in the Garden of Eden. Of course, the, we don't have the entire uh, second creation account where, where God um, creates Eve out of the man's rib. Um, this this uh, e- equal in dignity but distinct male and female that God has created them. Um, but we do see this. The scene picks up because basically it sets up um, uh, the creation um, of man. But then it goes right into the temptation account where the serpent, um, which is a symbolic of, of uh uh, reality that is a real um, person, which is the devil, Satan, this fallen angel, um, uh, tempts Eve, goes to Eve and says to her, you know, basically this temptation to turn away from God, to turn away from the Father, to disbelieve in God's love. And and, and I love this this insight from St. John Paul II, um, that the original sin, which um, Eve participates in, and then Adam participates in, and we see this because Adam is actually with Eve. It's not like it's just Eve's fault. We blame her, um, that Eve is there. She's being tempted. Um, uh, uh, these these lies of the enemy, and then Adam participates in that lie as well. That the original sin, uh, Saint John Paul II said, is an attack on fatherhood, uh, the fatherhood of God. Basically, saying that God is not your father who loves you. God is is a tyrant who's trying to keep something from you. So, in order uh, for you to be truly fulfilled, you have to, to reach out and take it for yourself. Um, so we see that in in um, Eve uh, reaching for the fruit, uh, getting getting this fruit of the knowledge of, of of good and evil, and giving some to Adam. And really, what's happening then is basically this lie that we can create ourselves, we can create our own reality, and that's something that the modern world lives in. We live in a world where, where we think that we can create our own reality, our own truth. Your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. And, and, and uh, that lie, because it really is a lie, um, to think that truth is somehow created by my mind instead of something that I am subject to, that is something that is bigger than myself. And because of that, mo- much of the sadness that we face as a society is a result of this lie of us having to create our own reality and create our own truth. Um, because then it becomes a s- source of constant stress and pressure and tension, anxiety upon us. We live in the most anxious society maybe in the history of the world um, uh, where so many people are suffering because... They're being told that you that they have to create their own truth. But instead, truth is not just a concept. Truth is a person, somebody that we actually have to encounter in the living God. And when we do that, it makes our lives so much better. And I'm looking at this as Domingo is... is saying hi to me here, my dog. So anyway, so that first read, so important about, about the fall. But then the, the beautiful good news that comes to us from Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the great psalm of repentance, um, where uh, David, in the midst of his in the midst of his sin, um, turns back to the Lord and repents of his sin. And uh, that, that repentance <laughs> really becomes, sorry, got a dog that is attacking me right now. That repentance becomes the, the source of a deep relationship of love with God. And so we see these words of Psalm uh, 51, the, the, our responsorial psalm, which is, Be merciful, O Lord, for we have sinned. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, in your goodness, um, in your grace. <laughs> In the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. So that 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 becomes our prayer. Not only that we ha- that we have sinned, but that we trust that God is going to take our sin away because He's merciful. That God is mercy. He is, and Jesus, as we enter into our our New Testament readings, is the face of God's mercy. So with that, we we look um, uh, this amazing reading from Roman Romans chapter five. Romans chapter five is one of the maybe, maybe the most theologically dense and important um, chapters in all of Paul's writings. And Romans chapter 5, he really gets into this reality of Adam and Christ. Adam who sinned, Adam who, who was 
called, created to be the image bearer of God in the world, and that he turned away from that image of God, um, that he fell into the lie of the enemy, and that the whole world is, is now under the domination of sin because of Adam's um, fall, because, uh, because Adam disbelieved in the truth of who God is and believed instead the lie of the enemy. And, and so because of that lie, because of that Satan, death now has domination over the entire world. But Jesus Christ as the new Adam, that's, that's really kind of the, the theological point that Paul is making, um, and he dives deep into that. What does it mean that the, through one man, sin entered the world, and death, death um, through, this, through sin, death, the death now is reigned from Adam to Moses. And basically Moses, the law um, um, that was given to the Jewish people, didn't save them from death, didn't save them from sin, but basically was able to diagnose it, was able to say that, um, that we have sin, that we're not in the right relationship with God. So we begin to change our behavior, begin to change um, the way we live to start to move back into conformity with God's will. And it's a painful process. If you've ever um, uh, maybe... Uh, have gone to the gym for the first time in years and years and years, and your muscles aren't used to working out, that you're not used to, uh, to um, uh, lifting anything heavy, to stretching at all, and you start to do that for the first time, it's painful. The next day after the first time you've been back to the gym is usually a, a very painful time. But that's part of what that process of conversion that was happening, happening with um, uh, the people of Israel as God was calling them back to, to himself to follow the law. Not that the law could save them, but the law begins to order their minds and hearts correctly back towards God, who is ultimately not, not just the, the lawgiver, but God, who is their father, who loves them. So that, that, of course, culminates in Jesus Christ. And we have this beautiful line um, that through the obedience, through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. That Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the hopes and promises of the people of Israel, and that he who is true God and true man, by his obedience to God, where we were as disobedient, Jesus Christ is obedient. And because of his death, he has brought acquittal under the law, so that, that we are, are now made righteous, that we who are unrighteous, we who, who are lawbreakers, we who who, um, who rebelled against God, because of Jesus, um, we, have, uh, we have been acquitted, we have been found not guilty, um, that our sins have been forgiven. That's really at, at the heart of our faith, and that's, that, that's the case that St. Paul is making in Romans chapter 5, especially in our verses that we hear today in the first Sunday of Lent, verses 12 through 19. So then, of course, our gospel. Our gospel this weekend is from Matthew chapter 4, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and it, it is the account in Matthew's gospel of, of the temptation in the desert. And this amazing, amazing scene really begins because Jesus has just been baptized just before this. Again, to set the stage, he's been baptized and then he's led by the Spirit. It says at that time, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And he's fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. So what I love is, and our bishop, Bishop uh, Will Walk, uh, Bill Walk has um, um, said this uh, uh, before that that when we're that Jesus is in the in the desert, he's fasting from food, but he's feasting on the love of the Father. And I love that image. That as we're fasting, hopefully you're entering into Lent by prayer, fasting, almsgiving, giving intentionally to the poor, to the church, by spending more time in prayer, by fasting, giving up food, giving up sweets, whatever it is you're giving up, giving up the internet. Um, but more importantly, that we're feasting on on the love of God the Father. So we fast in order to make room in our hearts to feast on that true love that God wants uh, to have for us. So Jesus has been um, anointed. We, we kind of see in time and space of the baptism of the Lord what has always been happening, that the Father has been loving the Son, um, saying, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This, this relationship of love, what the Catechism calls God's innermost secret, um, that's happening in this exchange between the Father and the Son from all eternity, and that in the incarnation, Jesus has entered into this world. Now at the baptism, he enters into the waters of the Jordan River. He comes up, and then the Father's voice is heard as the Holy Spirit, the love between the Father and the Son, is poured out and the Father says those words, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So it's in that power that Jesus goes into the desert, really to wage war on the devil. He goes into the wilderness to wage war on the devil and the lies of the devil because the devil has held God's people captive and Jesus desires to set us free. He is, he is our liberator. His very name means Yeshua, God saves. So Jesus goes into the desert, wages war, and then those lies of the enemy, those three, those three lies, those three temptations of the devil begin with the temptation if, 
if you are the son of God. And I think it's so important to recognize that every temptation we face starts there. That God wants to call into question your identity. But on the day of your baptism, you received an irrevocable identity and truth that you are God's beloved son. You are God's beloved daughter. And because of that, we can move forward in freedom. Because of that, we've been united to Jesus Christ. And Christ has given his identity with the Father, his relationship with the Father to us. So we receive that every time in a definitive way at our baptism, but every time we pray, every time we repent, we reclaim the truth of our identity. And so all the lies of the enemy that, that this bread will make you happy, this fame will make you happy, this power will make you happy, those ways that he uses of tempting Jesus, we can reject those lies and accept the truth of who we are and whose we are in Christ. So hopefully that's a, uh, just a good kind of uh, way to uh, jumpstart your weekend as we enter into the first Sunday of Lent. Please be praying for me. I'm going to Peru this week on a mission trip, and I'll be praying for you and uh, lifting you up as we journey with our Lord Jesus Christ together uh, to the glory of Easter. God bless.